Call to order. Item for discussion. PERS 2017 actuarial report. My mic's here, I'm sure. And other posts, uh, other uh, OPEP, which I didn't think we had any question with, but I guess we do. So. No, but there's, there's an issue, and you'll, it's a teaser. I'm going to so find out. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll find out. Okay. Well, thank you. Right, so, thank you. Yeah. So, the, the first item, the PERS, all we want to do is give the, the committee uh, an update on where we stand in PERS. The last time I think we met with you, we were talking 2016 actuarial numbers. The 2017 actuarial report came out in, is it August, August. September? So now we want to just update you where we're at and, and how, we, how we did in the last fiscal so year. Do we pay that backwards? I mean, why are we just getting the 2017 actuarials when it's the end of 2018? Yeah, they're, they're about a year and a <laughs> half or so behind. What, what does that mean? We never know how much we owe them? No, they, they do an estimate going forward, but then, then you get, I don't know if they do a true up on it or what they do, maybe yeah. Wes can explain it better. Yeah, so they're always a year behind, and most of that's because of the size of the pool and the number of agencies, so it takes them forever to get the actual results of the valuations. So they come out, uh, 2017, because they're in August 2018, so they're always a year behind. <clears throat> what we do for the financial statements is, is Gatsby 68, you may have heard me talk about it in the, mm -hmm. so they give us a tool that says, here are your balances of the 17, based on what we think, our assumptions and so on, roll forward, equal this in 2018. So that gives us our 2018 balance to report on the financial statements. But do we chew up what we owe them for 2017? Mm. Actuaries are famous for just kind of moving forward. So they don't really look back once they've, if they, they're gonna give us 18 next year, and we're not gonna compare it to their Gatsby 68 numbers. They're not gonna say, we're just gonna so if they were off, they'll just re <laughs> reforecast going forward. If they were if they underestimated costs, your your money that you owe them will just be higher the next year. It's not the true oh. past, but it's just to correct it going forward. Right. right. Okay. They're just gonna say here are your actuals for eighteen. There there'll be no mention of what their tool did. What history would have yeah. Okay. All right. So, but they do talk a lot about their assumptions and basis, and I, I was fortunate to go to the CalPERS seminar in October, right after I went and came back from Mexico, so I tried to pay attention as much as I could. Yeah. Um, but I learned a few things, and I'll try to share them with you today. You went to Mexico for five years? No. Uh, <laughs> I went on vacation to Mexico for my birthday for a week, and when I came back, I got back on Sunday night, I left for the CalPERS seminar, because it was in Palm Springs Monday morning. So I went there Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. How old are you now? 42. So you celebrated the ending of your 42nd birthday. You're now in your 43rd year. Yes, correct. That's trying to be a finance guy like you get your right. number. Yeah. That's, that's depressing to you know, I prefer to say 42. Okay. Early 40s. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so here we go. I'm just going to give you sort of a summary of the valuation and you actually have a copy of it that we passed out so you can see it's dated August 2018 but it's for the 2017 valuation. So here's our welcome screen. Got this one going still. Pretty pretty cool. I like it. Proud of it. I guess you are. Yeah. So who's that down on the bottom right hand side? That's us. That's us talking about grass and stuff. I like the, the wheel thing where it makes the mess and puts it into order. That's really my... Who are the people in the bottom right? It's us. Really? It's not really It's not really us. It's no. just, it represents us. <laughs> it's yeah. it's clipped. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you, don't, put, don't you really put you don't dress that nice. We're, we're putting together puzzles. We're making sense of numbers. It's great. Okay, so... <laughs> not very diverse if, if you group. Got, no, <laughs> if you got to explain it, it ain't that great. You know, you got to explain what it is. Okay. Give a little context as well. Okay. Okay, so today, as we talked about, we're just going to go over the, the new valuation from CalPERS. I'm going to talk about the UAL current balance of the funding status, which will give us the percentage funded as of 2017 again. Uh, some of our funding options that actually were talked about at the conference have been talked about pretty much by CWA, by us previously, uh, but I'm just going to go over some of it. There's actually one new thing in there that I did learn. Um, some alternative schedules. The amortization basis, which is one of the things I learned at the, well, let's say I learned, I tried to learn and I'm still learning about it, um, and I'll share what I've learned with you. And then next steps, how we plan to move forward with um, with those bases and how we will try to apply them. So the report as of 2017, it represents, represents the updated funding status. 
shows us changes in the market value of assets, uh, provides a basis for our future budgets. Um, and today we're actually going to focus on the miscellaneous plan. Uh, there are two of them. There's one for PEPRA and for miscellaneous, but PEPRA doesn't tend to have much of a UAL, if any, so really there's no point. It's, it's funded as it goes. And about 20, a little over 20% of our employees are PEPRA people, the lower pension plan. It's 23%, something like that. So this is a summary of the UAL and the funding status from 2011 to the 2017 report. <clears throat> and you can see that we started in 2011 at 78%. The funny thing about this, I find it funny, is that they really kind of broke out the UAL and the normal cost around 2013. Um, so showing the funding status prior to that is that's interesting to me, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so what we're focusing on today is the UAL balance is $16.9 million as of June 30th, 2017. Now this schedule shows that balance going down from 2016 from 17.1 to 16.9. And our funding status, according to the valuation, the most recent one, is 76.6%. Um, one of the actuaries I talked to at the seminar actually said that a 76% funded ratio is, is very impressive and a lot of agencies would kill to be 76% funded. Break it down to normal language. What does that mean to us? That means that 70, we have funded 76% of our total PERS liability. So it, what has been earned to date, we have, it's, say it was 50 million, actually I should say here, the accrued liability is 72 million. So we've actually funded 55 million of that. So we owe the $16 million. So what that 72 million means is that's how much you should have in your, I'll call it your bank account to pay for all your PERS expenses for the people that are already retired and the time that the current workers have already spent. Right. So that's how, if, if everyone stopped today and didn't accrue any more service credit, that's the number based on your expected rate of return that you would need to have to pay all the benefits for people's anticipated life, you know, lifespans. And right. like Wes just said, we don't have 72 million, we only have 55.6 in our bank, so we're short 16.9. Now, the reason for that short, is that normal to be short something? Yes. And a lot of it is a result of changes in assumptions, changes in, there's a schedule I'm going to show you with their, their basis for calculating what's owed. Um, <clears throat> but the liability is what's been earned for retire. and Glenn did a great job of explaining it, by retirees and, and current employees so far. So that's our liability. When they look at that, they say, okay, well, how did our, our total assets do compared to the market? So if, if we earn 2% and the market earned you know, 7%, we're gonna have a loss there and we're gonna be right up with a liability. Uh, there are other factors that are built into that and I'll explain a little bit more about that afterwards. Uh, a quick question from uh, 2011 to 2017, where about uh, accrued liability went up $30 million. Mm -hmm. Our share of pools market value only went up twenty million dollars. Does that mean that we should have put more money in, and we just didn't? Sort of. It means we should have put more money in. Uh, some of what's happening now is that they're saying they wanted to ramp up the contribution rate, and they're ramping it up to take it easier on employers. Because what they said in the last couple of years was the discount rate should be seven percent. We had it at seven point seven five initially, then seven point six five down, to, and they're they're ramping it down slowly. So what they're saying is the pool's earning 7%. So you should be contributing 7%. But most people didn't want to go straight from 7.75 down to seven. So we're ramping it down. So we're not contributing enough to earn what we should be earning. So okay. we're actually, we have a built-in liability there from here to here. And it's because people didn't want to take that immediate hit of increasing contributions from that big increase. But I think it's important to point out that Viacitos has paid everything that CalPERS wanted us to pay. Correct. Sure. Every year they say, you should pay us this much, and we paid it. Right. And in fact, we often paid it up front instead of in monthly installments. So we paid it up front, got a bit of a discount. They probably should have been asking us to pay a higher amount. Yes. But when you pay it up front, do you get a discount, or you just don't pay the interest? Basically, you, get, you don't pay the interest. Yeah, we saved like $35,000 a year the last three years or so by paying it up front. Yeah, we pay it like, what, July and 1? Has always done that, yes. or just the last three years? Ever since they implemented it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so yeah. it seems like we were in better shape in 2014, though, uh, with funding ratio at 83% than we are today. Yeah. So there again. And that's all based on 
Yeah, it's all based on their assumptions and what's changed there. Because as Glenn mentioned, we have paid everything that they've asked us to pay, and we've paid it in advance. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, so the $55 million for 2017, now, that, now we gave that money to CalPERS? That's what we've given to them, yes. That's our... And uh, this, just this one year alone? No. Oh. No, that's what's been... It's our total value of plan. <coughs> so everything we've contributed over the years, that's what it's valued at right now. Well, I got you. The bank account. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's that's the uh, fund of monies. Every year we give them more, but they take some out too to pay retirees. So that's the mm -hmm. that's kind of the balance of what's left. And it goes up and down based on earnings and other assumptions that are built into it. And so um, it doesn't. It, to me, it doesn't seem like it would make sense to be 100. percent But what 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 is a good funded ratio? Probably get to that a little I know, bit. I, yeah. and I, when I say good, I don't mean like, well, yeah, we're better than most, but because most are so horrible, what would be like really good, a good place to be? I think the closest to 100% would be the best place to be because then you're reducing the amount of interest that you're paying to them. So it, is so it does make sense to be close yeah, to yeah. The 100%. So that's 16.9 million, we're getting charged 7%. I think it's 7%. Uh -huh. uh, it's, they're treating it like a loan. Mm -hmm. The fronting us is 16.9 million that we're paying. And opinions may vary on it, but the opportunity cost of not funding this is if you're paying 7% while our debt is only you know 4% if you combine all of our debt. So there's a 3% difference there. So overall, the benefit would be to pay it as close to 100% as possible. So we're paying 7% on that. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're gaining 4% in the bank account. Well, we're only getting like 2.3 right now in the bank. I have big hopes for the people you hired. <laughs> Me too. I do. Okay, so 3%. I've had Anthony really like, start hammering on them. So we're losing 4% every month without doing anything. Yeah. I mean, just just mechanically it's happening. If you well, were on, that, on that 17 million. Right. right. And if you were to say we yeah. have those funds available to allocate them to this, then yes. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't it make sense to make those funds available? If that's what the board decides so, to do based on I know, but program. what do you think? I think it would. I mean, okay. there's, there's downsides to it too. Yes. Your days in cash and your. Yeah, it might go down to a double A. There are a lot of factors to consider in doing it, but if we were able. We're going to get into that or? Not today. Okay, good. Uh, today we're just going to go over the, the report and talk oh, okay. about that. But I will be doing, and I'll get. Let's let's go through this more, and we'll talk about it. But if we wrote them a check for 17 million, this mm -hmm. hypothetically, right? I mean, that doesn't mean next year we're just they're still going to probably. It doesn't stop, right? Right. right. I mean, so it, it's only a temporary like one. It's a it fixes this year, <laughs> but next year there'll be another unfunded amount. Well, it could go the opposite is. way too. It'd be a lot smaller. It could yeah. go. It could flop. Yeah. If the returns in the Calpers are ten percent, mm -hmm. then we'd have we'd be super funded at that yeah. time yeah. if we paid the seven sixteen million or whatever. Yeah. And right, they would pay us interest. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and like last year, for example, the market actually did better than the earnings that we expected. So we earned more than 7%. We still had an increase while well, this is showing a decrease. For this year in the financials, you'll see an increase in liability. And that's because we have a built-in liability and the fact that we're not paying the full discount rate. Because we haven't got down to the 7% yet. We're only paying 7.1, 7.25 this year and 7.15. That is a built-in increase in liability. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, too. When they send you a bill for 7.1, can you still pay 7.2? Oh, yeah. Yep. And we're going to get into that as well. We've got a lot to talk about. Yeah, they call them supplemental to... payments if you want to make pay more than the minimum required. So you can plan ahead. You can say, hey, yep. we got this deficit. We want to cut it down. Yep. Yeah. Because this has taken years to get to 16 million. This isn't overnight. This is five, 10 years. Most of this problem seemed to happen around 2013. And you'll see. So let's go on to the interesting. Hopefully it won't be too long, but we've got a lot to talk about. When, too long. when did you join the board? <laughs> <laughs> 2014. Wow. To so the best of my recollection. Okay, so some of the uh, <laughs> some of the funding options that, that I'd like to talk about are That's what exactly we, what I thought. Are what we've already talked about a little bit, hit on just now. Uh, additional discretionary payments. That's an option for us. You can keep. CalPERS is requiring us to go to a 20-year amortization schedule starting in 2020, I believe it is. Um, so we have to pay it off in 20 years, but there's nothing to say that we can't pay in an additional 100,000, 200,000 know, per year for that to reduce the length of time. So it's a 20 year amortization, but if we could set it to a 10 and make those payments so that we pay it off in 10 years, that would be additional discretionary payments. We can do that at any Continue point. paying the 7% though. 
you, it's still going to be at seven percent, but you'll pay it up quicker and save that seven percent amount of time that you pay it. So and balance on that, so you'll save a lot of interest by doing that. And I so you the, sell that program? That's the program. I can of, yeah. tell. Yeah. <laughs> well, because the other other options, there's the voluntary shortening of amortization period. Fresh they start. They call it the mean? fresh start. That's where you basically say, I'd like to make my amortization 15 years. So then they tell you, okay, now you're on a 15 year amortization, but you're locked into it forever. Here's your new payment plan. You have to pay these payments based on 15 years. Mm. If for some reason you ran into financial hardship, you can't change back to 20, even though other agencies are doing 20. It'd be like refinancing your house. If you had a 30 year mortgage and went to a 15, you limited your flexibility, but you could save a lot of money. So that doesn't make a lot of sense when you consider the fact that you could just make additional payments, pay it off in 15, and have the flexibility to go back to 20. Not being years. locked into it. Exactly. And the, the third option here is the 115 trust. Um, some agencies are doing that, and some of the benefits of the 115 trust, you put your money aside, basically, it can only be used for CalPERS. Some of the benefits to that are if you've got it in the 115 trust, and say when you, you do run into financial hardship and you can't make your PERS payments, it's here. So you can actually now take this money mm -hmm and put it towards the PERS payments or do whatever. So if you can't make this payment, you can do it that way. But if you've already paid into PERS, you don't have this pool over here to kind of save you from that hardship. Other, otherwise, what else can you do with the 115 money besides pay PERS? You can't do anything. It's up. It's why would you do that? When you just pay it's only if you think that you can't afford to make the advance payments without um, that kind of cushion, really. That's that's the major benefit of the 115. And some people feel you can get a better rate of return on a 115 yeah. trust. You're not limited. PERS has certain investment rules that some people think are, are too conservative. So the 115 trust, you have more flexibility, you can get more aggressive, but with being more aggressive comes more risk, too. But yeah, and you also, I mean, if you just make the additional payments, you you're, you got a guaranteed 7%. Right. And that's probably pretty hard to do with being, if you're trying to be conservative, at least relatively conservative, 7% is probably the best you're going to be able to do anyways, even in invested time. Even CalPERS isn't earning 7%, no. but they're estimating that it should be earning 7%. And, yeah. and CalPERS doesn't recognize 115 trusts for the, for the liability, right? So we owe them $16.9 million. If we put $16.9 million in a 115 trust, CalPERS is still going to charge a 7% on the 17 well, million sure. okay. because we haven't paid them. And right. And both will be reported on your financial statement. So you have an asset and a liability both shown there. So they're just separate funds. So this one's earning what it's earning. This one's charging what it's charging. Um, <clears throat> but what's interesting about that is that CalPERS is actually coming out with a new pension prefunding trust fund that wasn't offered previously. They're actually just coming out with it now. So. It's mostly private organizations now that are offering these 115 trusts. CalPERS is developing their own. So it, it's <coughs> interesting to me because you could send the money to PERS or you could send the money to PERS and put it in their trust fund. If it was in their trust fund, would they recognize it as an offset to no. your liability? It still so is not. It's same, the same, same thing. thing. Okay. They're just starting a new line of business. Yeah. <coughs> so those are the options. I actually. I'm going to let Anthony talk for a minute because he, he developed this, this schedule for you. So let's see. <coughs> yeah, so this, is, oh, so this is just kind of meant to illustrate an example of what has previously been discussed. But at 7%, a 20 year amortization of the projected 2019 unfunded liability, a 15 year and a 10 year. So by moving from 20 years to 15 years, you're saving about $4.3 million in interest. And by going from 20 years to 10 years, you're looking at 8.3 million. So in the report, they, they so have that, that would be the fresh start kind of approach. Right. This yeah. could be either way. Either way, but set it or you can just make it yourself. Right. But you could internally go to a 10-year amortization yep. just by paying them that much without locking in. Right. And that way, if you run the financial hardship, you don't pay it, and you're not locked into it. And that's something that I would recommend without really thinking. It's just not a, an option. The fresh start to me doesn't make any sense. Right. Okay. So in the report, they do have a 30-year amortization schedule, but subsequent to publishing this, they did away with that. And they originally had a five-year ramp up and then a, a ramp down. And they changed it to you could do no more than 20 years, and it's level. So that's what this illustrates here. And that's what we've budgeted for. So everything's been built in the right budget. None, really nothing in this valuation report is surprising to us or has not been accounted for in the budget, so we don't have a lot of concern there. Just out of curiosity, so between the, the 20 and the 15, I, I, I totally get the uh, um, 
giving ourselves the flexibility. But am I doing the, the math right? What is that, about 270 different, two, 270,000 dollars a year different? Yeah. Give or take? Yeah, between yeah. the 1.656 yeah. and the yeah. one point. Yeah, it's 270,000 dollars a year annually. Is that really that significant to a, 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 a utility like ours where we would be that concerned about? I mean, if we fall in such hard times where $270,000 is that big of a deal, we got bigger problems, right? You're right. So the reason why I kind of, the, the, one of the things I like about the 15 year, and this coming from a guy that just you know a couple years ago refinanced my house for 15 years, um, is that it does kind of force you to be more disciplined. And yes, while we could have the flexibility to pay them more now, Wes, you, you, you take off and you leave and the new person comes in and maybe not as disciplined as you are. Next election, there's three new board members, maybe they're not as disciplined as we are. This kind of puts a little bit more, you know, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna prioritize this. And so uh, I just wanted to put that out there too because I can see both sides of it. And I just think the $270,000 a year, and it just seems like, I mean, the way that you know, we you know, when you're running a basically a you know a business the size of this business, yeah. um, that's not that much money. It's about an eighty million dollar a year combined budget. Yeah. Well, plus the fifteen year, we will both be here. <coughs> I will. We'll so see. <laughs> past June twenty fifteen. This guy's still on probation. Yeah, I still got a couple. Oh, really? oh sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. so just some, I mean, again, just some food for thought. I mean, you know, it's not. And then you also you you're by doing that well, you're saving four point three million dollars. Well, and uh, along with your thought in refinancing your house, when you do that to a fifteen year mortgage, the big advantage is that you get a lower interest rate usually. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The question has been asked here and it was asked at the conference: What happens if you refinance and you go to a fresh start at ten year? Do we get a lower discount rate? No, we don't have to do the same. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's where it doesn't make a lot of sense, yeah. if any to do the fresh start because you get the same interest rate and you just have to pay more. One thing the district may want to do to address uh, Director Sonella's comment is maybe development of a policy that, that addresses this. It doesn't have to be committing to a 15 year or a 10 year, but you can develop a policy that talks about, you know, what, what do you call it, accelerated payments or whatever they're called. Additional discretionary payments. Yeah, and, and I think there are, policy, there are policy questions that surround this whole issue of how do we make these accelerated. Yeah, I, I like the, personally, I like the policy of leaving as much leeway as possible for future boards, yeah. rather than locking them into something that they walk in the door and they're locked into it, and who knows what may happen financially in between. Yeah. That's just a thought. Well, there are a lot of things we should discuss in the future, such as the sewer replacement fund is coming up awfully close to the, to the ceiling. Um, we have the extent mm -hmm. we're okay. <laughs> That'll take care of it, you think? <laughs> take care of it. So Anthony actually asked me, was it today in the meeting? He asked me, he's like, well, we're coming up really close to the ceiling. Should we be taking some of that money if we do and looking at re like paying off our debt? Because we've got the variable rate debt that was talked about, but that's at 2.44%. So that wouldn't make sense when you have the option of potentially paying this down versus paying down the debt. That you make? That is a 2008 loan, I believe, that we have the... Um, it's LIBOR plus 0.75, and it's currently at 2.44%. So it's easy to make that one. Yeah. So it's not a problem. Do you know why we get a loan then rather than another bond? Or rather? Because of the advantage of the interest rate. The, oh, okay. the direct loans, direct placement, private placement loans, and the, the loans like that, especially with the LIBOR being as low as it was, it, I mean, our 2015 refunding is somewhere around 5.6 or something like that, I want to say. Whereas the 2012 loan that we did, it's a private placement loan at 1.98% fixed. So if you only need yeah. 12 million, I think we did $7.1 million, you can get that at 1.98. I mean, Why not? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wes touched on something that's kind of important that we don't talk about much. These numbers are the total district liability. We need to figure out how to apportion that between water and wastewater customers and funds because we have employees that service the water and the wastewater side. They're really two separate fund sources. So there needs to be a proper allocation for those payments, how much is being charged to water customers in that budget, and how much is being charged to wastewater customers. But we won't get into that level of detail now, but if the board makes a decision to make some of these payments, we need to figure out where it's coming from. I thought we were going to cut the electric bill here. <laughs> That'll be a start. It's going to get cut by the solar. 
built in. Hundred thousand dollars a year. That would be built by what? Twenty twenty five. <laughs> well, it's hopefully the so next few weeks, yeah. actually. We've got to go live, I believe. So at least in the West yeah. Wing. Yeah. So this is where it's going to get confusing, and hopefully <laughs> I can keep my my self uh, on in tr on track here and, and help you to, yeah, I know it's a lot of numbers, and they're really small, too. I just kind of paste it. This is on this is Michael's page. domain here, I can mm -hmm. tell. Mm -hmm. I think it's no? on, this is on page 9 of the this evaluation. This is cover, so. If you want to follow along, it's something you can actually see. So when I went to the seminar, I talked to an actuary and I asked him, I said, well, what's the, if we sent $17 million to you, what's to say that, you know, we don't have, are fully funded one year and the next year we're $5 million short? Like, how do we determine that that's, is there any guarantee? Like, how does it, and we're in a pool. The pool concerns me because we're in a pool with a bunch of other agencies. How do we know you're not just going to blend it in there, change your assumptions, and next thing you know we're short, and, but we shouldn't be? How do we see that the direct allocation of our funds to our liability? that I want to make sure that that's happening. And he said, well, you have different UAL bases, and you, you get to decide which UAL base you want to apply your money to. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about right now. <laughs> 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 uh, I was like, what is a UAL, UAL base, and you know, where do I see them in the valuation report, and you know, how, do we, what, you know, how can we go about looking at that? So he said it's on page nine of your valuation report. These are your bases, and you can actually see here, there are three of them. It, they just repeat. And as I mentioned before, they started breaking out the UAL payment and the uh, normal cost around 2013 because that's when they realized they had an issue, that they weren't collecting what they were uh, estimating. So they broke it out, made it easier on everybody. Plus, people were complaining, which, which portion is my normal cost, which portion is my UAL? And you know, I want to be able to track this. Your reports are just confusing. So they broke it out in 2013, and they started tracking it, and it looks like this. So you can see there's a share of the pre-2013 UAL where it starts, we ended up with a, our beginning balance was a $6.5 million uh, loss. Yeah, loss, so we ended up, that was our, our UAL in 2013. From there, the three different bases are asset, non-asset, and assumption changes. So the asset bases, it's basically market versus actual earnings. So if our amount of money earned 3%, and the market earned seven, and we got we didn't earn enough, so on and so forth. We ended up with a liability built in there. The non-asset gains and losses. That's uh, things like salary increases, mortality. So if people are dying earlier than we thought, based on the, the plan estimates, and inflation rates. So inflation is higher or lower than what the plan's estimating. Typically, that the non-asset changes are smaller than the other two, because uh, the asset is the whole pool what it's earning. Uh, non-asset tends to be a little bit smaller. And then you have the assumption changes. The assumption changes are things that CalPERS has built into their projections, like the discount rate, the number of employees, certain things like that that are kind of built into there. So the, the asset and the assumption change are really going to be your, your major changes. And what I'd like to point out in this is, mm -hmm. so our market versus actual earnings in 2017, for example, we had a gain there. So the market did better. So than we thought it was going to. So we, we gained $1.9 million in 2017. However, because of the discount rate, you can see that we lost $1.2 million because we weren't paying in what should actually be paid in. We paid what they told us, but not what needs to be paid to match the market earnings or the projected earnings. Mm -hmm. So that being said, this actually shows our total uh, UAL at the end of 2017 of the 16.9. So you can kind of see from 13, we started with a beginning amount 6.4, up and down, up and down, up and down, different years, because each year has three of those bases, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, to get to our current UAL. So it's kind of showing just the activity in the account and how to get there. At first, that looks really confusing, but if you kind of narrow it down like that, I think it helps to understand what's happening in the schedule. So that's what he meant by UAL bases. <clears throat> and then you can see in these three numbers, those are our UAL payments. That's where we've been advanced or I don't want to say advanced paying, but we're paying up front to save money. And that's how those, those amounts are allocated to our, our balance. What's kind of confusing to me is why they still carry the 2013 number. So for example, you have the 6.4, $6.5 million at the very beginning there. But then you have an asset gain in 2014 of $5.1 million. So why doesn't the 6.4 get decreased down to 1.3 and just get rid of that altogether? That's a question I need to ask an actuary to see. Anthony has a theory that, and I don't know if you saw it there, so I'm throwing it under the bus here. <coughs> Maybe but I don't say it, but 
But <laughs> since, <laughs> since they're different pools, they may be earning different rates, or they may have different assumptions built into them. So they need to keep them separated so that you track what's happening in each one of them. That's one kind of theory on it. I, I'm, I plan to clarify that with an actuary. I, get a call. I actually called every single actuary on the list today. Only one of them answered the phone. It was kind of funny. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. You can see we paid the 671 in 2017, 18, 900 this year, and then we're going to be paying 1.2 for next year. The actuarials you're just speaking of, who are they working for? The calipers. <coughs> and they have a list of them mm -hmm. that you're able to call and ask questions? Mm -hmm. So there's a representative for each county. So you can actually look up, ours is Nancy Campbell. Um, so you, you look up the rep. Have you ever met her? I've met Nancy. I don't know if I have. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's come down, she presented at the Water Authority and I met her there it's about six months or so ago. Right. I met Kerry Worgan. He's actually, I think, Los Angeles County. Um, I spent, I talked to him quite a bit at the CSMFO conference. Does the actuarial come down very often? No. There have been a, some cubicle up in Sacramento I know, crunching numbers all the time. And they don't answer the phone very often either. And so they have a very small budget to travel. Mm -hmm. I asked her to come to uh, Viacitos. She goes, uh, our trip down to the San Diego County Water Authority was our trip for the year. So. Mm -hmm. But Viacitos can go to her. Yeah, we probably could. I would assume. Yeah. Which is probably a good idea to get to meet the person. Yeah. So if you look at those three circled numbers, and you know, yeah. Wes kind of touched on this, but the middle one is what we, we included in this year's budget, 900000 So next year we're going to pay... Two hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars more next year than we did this year. So keep that number in mind because our next item on OPEB will all refer to that. Okay. So that's the the amortization basis. This is going to be in our next steps. We're going to look at talking about that, and that's actually my next slide. So that works out pretty well. So <clears throat> at the seminar, they also told me that to understand that better, I should contact my actuary and ask them for this Managing Employer Contribution Spreadsheet because it lets you do scenario analysis and what it does is you can take, say we wanted to contribute the full $16.9 million. You can take the 16.9 and apply it to your asset base. So you put it to this base here where we currently it's at negative 1.0, that's just mm -hmm. one year. So it, it'll break out the 16.9 on the total balance of these bases. So the asset base would be like these two together plus the total balance over the years and you can apply it to that. And I think they actually do it. I, again, I have to look at this worksheet to understand it better and get a feel for it. And the next steps will be to do scenario analysis and applying uh, to the asset bases. <coughs> but I think you can actually go to 2013 and put six million there and then go to 2014 and put, you know, if there's a balance in that year, to reduce each one of these bases, uh, how they're laid out here. So the $900,000 that's included in this budget already. Yep. Yeah. It's broken down to water and wastewater. Yes, 5149. Yeah. 51 our, our labor costs 51 are 50, 49. 51 percent <coughs> water and 49 percent wastewater. It just happens to be. And wastewater only has six employees. Oh no, you're talking about just metal arc. No, there's there's a lot more involved. Oh in wastewater. Yeah, 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 Portions yeah. of James's time and the portions that you have the source collection through. Time. And, yeah. Everybody's time is cut. Yeah. It's based on the total of the activity of the district. So basically where everybody works all the time. You're taking that broken out and said 51% of the staff works here and 49% works here. So we're going to allocate general stuff using that, that methodology. So we've we already allocated 900000 for this year. Yeah. Yes. The reason I brought that up about the water and wastewater split before is because if we had a, I'll call it a windfall on one side or the other, um, like the Diamond Environmental, $600,000 comes in, whatever the number is, you could have put that towards the... the wastewater. The, yeah, that would have been for wastewater share of the UAL. We have to make sure that we don't just say, hey, we had a good water year, so we're going we're gonna to take right. all of our water money and, and right. retire our debt. So where was it placed for now? It's just in the reserves right now. Yeah. In the sewer replacement reserve. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the that's next step. Yeah. So the next step will be for me to go through the sheet that was brought in <coughs> and to start looking at the scenarios and kind of plugging in numbers and seeing where we can get savings and how it will affect us that way. Um, overall, the see it's almost better to look at the savings on a general basis. So you can see, like Anthony showed you, his spreadsheet was a good analysis for a, a broader view, whereas going into her basis will just give staff comfort as to if we're putting it somewhere, we know that it's going to go there. And that way we won't have to look at a pool and go, we should have done this, because when we get our report, it'll show like this, 
and if we plant, if we paid that 6.4 off, it should be gone next year. Yeah, so that way we'll know that 17 was applied, and they'll only be able to change the future years, and our money will actually count towards it. I don't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either, and that's why I went and talked to the guy. And I'm like, I don't, you know, this whole change of assumptions you got going on now, it fluctuates so much. Because if you look at the change in those, the assumption change is, you know, one point one million dollars, and that's a loss. It just offsets our gain. I'm like, so you could just put a number in there to say, yeah, you guys gained this, but guess what? We're taking it away from you. Cool. Yeah. And yeah. what happened in June 30th, 2014, where we had um, the 5.2 come back to us? Like, I don't remember 14 being that great of a year for the stock market. Yeah, that's the asset part too. So that must be because we didn't pay any additional money that year. We paid that what was. Seems, that seems pretty significant. I could pull out some of the old numbers. The board may remember at a previous board meeting I gave, I went through and tried to correlate CalPERS investment returns versus the UAL. So I can refresh those numbers and send them out to the board. And it, and it tracks what the uh, CalPERS rate of return was by year. So you yeah, can, you can kind of correlate. 14 actually might have been a pretty good year. Yeah. Um, yeah com coming out, of the two years coming out of the recession. <laughs> well, that's good because we needed it too. Because we had what year I got on the finance committee? committee. <laughs> that's what they would all recall. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I joined the board in January 14th. That's my job. <laughs> so, yeah, so that gave me some comfort in understanding these bases a little bit. So that'll help in the future scenarios. And that's all. You got eight people putting the puzzle together. You only five guys standing over there. So what's the. Three of them weren't needed? I don't know. Oh. Uh, Labor reduction. Yeah, that's. They, they put it together, they analyzed it. Uh -huh. Yeah, nice graphic. If I use that graphic like to our executives, I, I would be, be in trouble. The bottom right one? Yeah. yeah. No, no yeah. diversity? Yeah. So from a timing perspective, I, I think next, so we're in the eighteen nineteen budget year right now. When you go into the nineteen twenty budget year, which we'll be doing next, and we're, we're starting that process right now, but the board will probably be seeing it in the February-March time frame, for the, and the finance committee will see it before then. That's when we're going to have to start uh, factoring in the new 20-year amortization. So that we're going to be looking for direction, not today, but at a subsequent meeting to find out how do you want to handle this new timeline that PERS has established. Right. Well, not just for next fiscal year, but for like a long-term plan. We actually built the 20-year amortization into the last budget because we, okay. we knew it was coming, so we built it into it. Now it'll just be a matter of looking at what the, mm -hmm. the UAL is in the next budget and whether or not, you know, what the payment's going to be on that. And then actually I looked at it compared to what we budgeted and it's not that far off. Yeah. So. Well, when you say budget, you mean plan because we, we don't have a budget for next year. Yet. Right, in the five year. In yeah. the five year forecast, right. All right. All right. That's it. That's, that's, it. It. that's all I got. Okay, number two. Ann, could you bring up the, uh, I had a PowerPoint open. It was minimized already. So when do you anticipate bringing that, the, the diamond money up to the board to discuss next steps with that? Uh, well, it whenever the, yeah, the board would want it, like I said, right now it's just sitting in the reserve, so there's no oh, formal decision that was made by, I guess, kind of our policy yeah. when you bring in this money, is it just goes there. Yeah, but I'm just looking at it from a $600,000 windfall, if we just applied it to, um, right. our, I mean, that's 7% of that money right there, right? We're not getting 7% by sitting in reserves doing nothing. No, we're not. Mike, could you pass me the uh, mouse or the, the mouse or clicker or anything so I can kind of drive this thing? Put you on the way. I could too. Yeah. Could so, well, that's why yeah. I said like the board probably has to have a discussion about that. That's a good point too. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit. This will be kind of a brief conversation about uh, OPEB, other post-employment benefits, and just kind of go by the numbers for Viacitos. So this is a program, and it's geared primarily for um, health-related costs. It's no longer available to new hires. Anybody after June 30th of 2013 does not get OPEB. For those people that were hired before that time, there's some eligibility requirements. You have to work for the district at least five years. Suppose somebody came from another district. If we hired somebody from No. Nope. You mean if they came like tomorrow, they somebody hired? No. Nope. After it. 2013. After 2013. Right. If somebody joined Viacitos from another district prior to 2013, they would have been eligible. Right, but after 2013, so... It doesn't matter where you come from. So it's really hard to steal people now. Well, it, it, it hurt our ability to steal people. Right. But most other agencies have done the same thing we've done. Not all of them 
very few of them still have OPEB for new employees. Oh, okay. They have their legacy employees that have it and the retirees that have it. So for our program, you, you have to work for the district for five years and you must retire from Viacitos. From Viacito. So if you work for Viacitos for 10 years and then you went to go work for Livenhain and retired from Livenhain, you've lost all your OPEB eligibility for Viacitos. So you have to retire from the district to get oh, okay. it. So, uh, a quick question, and how do you know that they're not working for someone else? And actual reports, how do you know, it's kind of morbid, I'm sorry, but I have to ask, how do you know when someone dies and you stop paying them benefits? PERS stops paying them, how does PERS know? The federal government knows, for instance, when you die for Social Security, and they cut you off and you pay your last check to them. That's the federal government. How does PERS know to stop sending those checks to Mr. and Mrs. Finkel? Yeah, I, I don't know how it gets followed from somebody filing a death certificate all the way to PERS so they know they can stop paying. How does PERS know? And we're not on the hook. We, we can look into that. I don't know. I'm very curious how they know when you have to end benefits because yeah. I understand there's an awful lot of fraud with that. Yeah. An awful lot of fraud with that. You hear the stories all the time. Yeah, so there's got to be some truth to yeah. that. Right. Wait, I, that is a good question because if, if uh, an empo a retired employee passes away, like, and the wife doesn't doesn't notify PERS, then how 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 would they otherwise know? And the checks just keep coming. It, it's not hard to right. cash a check with the same last name. Well, it's you know, in a joint account. Same account electronically, probably. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't really matter. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. That's a great question because they actually track for CalPERS as well. The retirement plan. They have the mortality rate in there, so that's part of that. Right. So they do keep track. Yeah, but I like how they do it because there's yeah. a way we should check on that because. I don't have my rose colored glasses on. But if there's a way to cheat, people will cheat. That's a great question. Especially with that. I've often thought about it. But when my mom passed away, I went, well, I keep getting the Social Security checks. I got a letter within a week from the federal yeah. government saying, you owe us for that last one we sent your mom. And yeah. uh, okay, whatever. That's probably because the, the hospital or um, they probably have the, they probably, they probably have requirements to notify the It gets reported best. somewhere, but it's the federal government. I think CalPERS. Yeah. I, I bet that CalPERS has a parallel process that they, they are somehow tied into notification of people dying. And with the OPEB, though, it's not like we got you a check. We write the check to Kaiser or to, I don't know who we yeah. write the check yeah. to. So it's, you know, if you had single coverage, it's $300 a month, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. So we're not paying it to you, we're paying it to the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. But yes, yeah, that's, yeah, we, that's, we need to notify to stop paying those. Yeah, yeah. as well as the stop payment for. Uh, the people that we do pay OPEP to for their kids and right. kids and right. whoever it is. So Just curious. I mean, there's got to be a way. And I don't know what it is and how well they do it. Yeah. Yeah, well, Andy, uh, Anthony wrote down the, uh, the question and we'll get back okay. to you guys too. So the third bullet there, there's 104 employees that have some level of eligibility. 28 have already retired, so they're locked in. 76 active employees were hired they were, means they retire or were hired before 2013. Right. Doesn't mean they'll get it because if if somebody leaves and goes to work for another district, they will now fall off that number. They will no longer retain Biocidos eligibility because they, they won't retire from Biocidos. Oh, okay. So okay. So the question is, how do we know they actually retired, or they're still they went to work someplace? Else? Yeah, we've had employees left. One recent about a year and a half ago went to Rancho California Water District. He was an employee. He was hired before but 2013. But you knew that because he told you. He, yeah. He well, they what about the well. employee that doesn't tell you? Well, if they leave here and go work somewhere else, what we know. Is, is that what you're yeah. saying? If they work for somebody else. They go work in Northern California. Yeah. Well, they're not working here anymore. We know that. But then they might not be working. And they they haven't put in the retiree paperwork. They haven't filed for retirement. So we would get notice that they filed with PERS to retire. And to get the benefits. Mm -hmm. Right. Both their OPEB benefit and their PERS retirement benefit. Oh, two very separate things. Because sometimes you have someone retire young and you figure they're going to game the system somehow. Yeah. No offense. And you think that'd be a huge incentive to keep people here, though? I mean, if you're within 10 years of retirement. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it would be pretty, you know, not, not too smart to leave. And, <laughs> unless, you, you unless you went to an agency that also offered it for some reason. But otherwise, yeah. you're walking away from a very lucrative yeah. benefit. Oh, yeah. So Wes got done talking about our actual unfunded accrued liability and our actuarial for the PERS side. So our number from the OPEB side, um, the latest actuarial report, I think it was in 2017, 
our liability for OPEB is $5.3 million. And they break that down between how much is for people that have already retired and how much is for people that are current employees that will be retiring. And you see the breakdown, and you'll notice the 2.3 and the 3.0 add up to the $5.3 million. So right now, and this is just a simplified graph, every year we have uh, on the left side district funds, basically our budget. We take money from our budget, and we, we for OPEB-related costs, we put it into four places. We're putting money aside for uh, to establish this trust fund for retirees, to establish a trust fund for the current employees that are eligible, but every year we're also writing a check to Aqua JPIA to pay the, the current year medical costs for both retirees and for current employees. So we have basically four places that we're, we're spending money. But over the last couple of years, or I guess just last year, we stopped paying into those OPEB for the retirees and the current employees because we fully funded the trust. So we no longer have to write a check to them. You, you may recall that we were putting $200,000 a month for like nine months, and that got us to the $5.3 million that the actuary said we needed to set aside for all the retiree, so we no longer pay that. So, so there's the 5.3. What, what year was that 1.8 million paid? It was last fiscal year. 2018. Yeah. So in this year's budget, you didn't include that 1.8 million? Correct. Right. So the 5.3 is sitting in a trust for, for OPEB, but going forward, every year we do, this current year we're in right now, we write a, a check to, on a monthly basis, but it adds up on an annual basis, to Aqua JPIA for $2.6 million to get eligibility for the, for the medical benefits for both our retirees and our current employees. So we're gonna look at this medical for retirees. So that, that's the important part, and that's what, I wanted, that's what I wanted to talk about this with the board today, just to put this on your radar screen. So for the medical for retirees, why isn't this not working? Oh, some numbers aren't coming up. So instead, I'll, I'll go back. So instead of paying from the district funds for the medical for retirees, we're going to stop that process, that goes away, but it comes in and we, we're suggesting that the board may want to consider paying for uh, medical, for retirees' medical costs from the trust fund, not from the annual budget. So if you take that $2.6 million that we pay every year, or at least we're paying this year, for all of the employees that are eligible, about 400000 of that is for uh, retiree medical. So, and we think that should be paid for out of the trust. Otherwise, you've fully funded the trust and you're continuing to pay the annual cost for the, for the retirees. You're almost double, double paying for those folks. So if, if we used the $400,000 out of the trust, that would reduce our current medical cost to $2.2 million. So we would basically save out of the budget, we'd save about $400,000 and the reason I, from the last presentation, I asked you to remember that number 270,000. So our PERS costs may go up $270,000, but our medical costs from a budgetary perspective will go down by $400,000. So we'd actually see a, a net decrease in our combined PERS and OPEB costs in next calendar, the next fiscal year. So the, the o, OPEB we currently pay out for retirees is $400,000? Right, so you, you take that $2.6 million that we write to Aqua JPIA for all of our medical costs, and you look at it, and Mike helped me with the numbers, about 400000 of that is for the employees that have already retired. Them and their eligible dependents. It could be a spouse or a spouse and a family. Do we do we know that OPEB, oh, I'm sure we do, but OPEB for retirees is $400,000. So $400,000 a year we're paying for our retirees. How many retirees is that? Well, I think it's that. So 28, 28 plus whatever dependents. Yeah, they go have. back up to. 28 employees. So that's that the, kind of the fifth or fourth line down. Already retired, those 28 so people. 28 divided by 400,000? Well, they have different plans. Yeah. So certain people are eligible for the spouse and the children, other people are eligible for the spouse, depending on when they retired and what was available to them at the time. So you have to look at the 28 and to see how much is each person is counted. So it could be 60 people, but we don't really know. And the, well, we do know, we just don't know. And their that. children have to be what age? I don't know if there's a requirement for 26 that. is typically the maximum. Yeah. If, 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 a, if a dependent child is 26 and still a full-time student, they can still be covered. If they're not a full-time student, then I think it's like 22. How many retirees can you have 
with 26 year old children? There's not that many. There's probably two, three. We have to break down. We just don't. Okay, so you're not paying for children. And all probably paying for two or three. A couple. Yeah, there's a couple. couple. So and then both. divide that number for me. It's about fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand a year we're paying out to each one of those employees, average. Yeah. Some are with spouse, and some are with not. When did we cut off the spouse? So, uh, well, the spouse would be cut off when they're sixty-five. There's a number of things. You when know. do we cut that off as a benefit, though? Sixty-five. 65. When they're eligible for Medicare, they stop getting the OPA no, no. benefit. The spouse to. Oh, the spouses are still eligible. So if right. someone was pre two thousand thirteen a current employee, their spouse is still eligible when they retire. Really? Yeah. Yep. So Mike did the math, and it's about fifteen thousand dollars per eligible retiree, and that's about and what our rate is today for married plus one. So if you got, when we when we budget, it's about thirteen or fourteen thousand, I think, that we put aside for medical costs for married plus one. So it's a little higher. It's fifteen thousand okay. because a couple of those have children as well. And who checks that? That knows the kid turned twenty-seven. We have a database in HR that when people first sign up with the district, they, you have to list all your eligible dependents. So you list your spouse. How old is your spouse? Your children. Show us your birth certificate. So that's the time to lie, or you have to show birth certificate. Yeah, birth well, certificate. We're, we're checking all that stuff, either Social Security information or birth certificates to show that they're eligible Always dependents, have. and then we track it. Yeah, so HR, when they say, hey, uh, Jimmy's kid just turned 26, they'll tell Jimmy that your kid is no longer eligible. We're taking them off the, the plan. Oh, okay. And that's not just for retirees, that's for active uh, employees as well. If your kids, if your dependents are no longer eligible under our guidelines, they're dropped from the coverage as well. But once you're plus two, you're plus 50. Yeah, so the highest rate is employee plus family. So there's employee, employee plus one, and employee plus family. There's only three different categories. So whether you have one kid or five kids, it's the same rate. Yeah. So, so that's it, I think that's, yeah, that's the last slide. So we're just trying to demonstrate that there's an alternative way to pay for a portion of our uh, retire or our medical costs, and it's an appropriate way. We're not stealing money from a, a trust fund. The fund was established to do this very thing. So we think it's worthy of the committee and the board's consideration in the next budget years and subsequent budget years to actually start drawing down on the trust to, to relieve, to draw down on the trust for one and to relieve the current year budget of that requirement. What's our savings? 400000 It's 400000 So Is our savings? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it's a savings. You're getting the money from another source. You already right. took money and put it in the trust. Now we're just suggesting you start taking money out of the trust instead of paying for it. How, the How much does the trust have in it? $5.3 million. So it's only going to last. But it's considered fully funded for the retiree benefits because based on CalPERS projections. Right. So they projected that those retirees were going to cost this amount of money over the life of their benefits, and we fully funded what they projected. So therefore, we should have, in theory, funded what it's going to cost those right. retirees for the rest of their eligibility. In every two years, they do an actuarial analysis. On the PERS side, retirement, they do it every year. On the OPEB side, they do it every two years. So if, if they do a subsequent uh, actuarial analysis and it shows that our assumptions were a little off, either high or low, they'll tell us what the number should be. They may say, hey, you, you fell below, you're fully funded by 100000 Then we would probably suggest that the board include in the budget $100,000 to keep the, the trust fund fully funded. The good news is in this is that the current budget, as we've mentioned before, we're not paying that 200000 so we're saving that. But we aren't because we, weren't, we didn't budget to contribute that 200000 The good news here is we did budget to pay 400000 in our five-year plan. So if the board decides that we no longer want to fund it from the operating budget, that is in effect a budgeted savings. So that can be looked at in future budgets to go towards CalPERS. So one thing the board may want to consider going forward is looking at the PERS and the OPEB combined and how are we doing. If you look at one, the PERS, it's going up, but I think we found a way to reduce the other costs. So combined, we may actually see a decrease next year. The year after that, I'm not sure because PERS continues to increase but uh, that, I think that's a, a good way to look at it. Combine what are our combined labor costs? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So that's all I had. And we're not looking for direction. It's just to plant an idea, uh, put it on your radar screen. As we start getting into the first quarter of next year, next calendar year, we'll start talking uh, budget 
uh, ideas with the committee, and this this will come up. So, just wanted to plant the seed early. Excellent. That's it. That's all yeah. we have. That concludes the meeting. So we'll. Uh, we'll close the meeting.